So uh, my name is Peter Bax. I'm at York University Department of Biology. I'm a professor. I uh, uh, teach and I also run a research lab that focuses on heart disease and in particular with a focus on uh, cardiac arrhythmias. Um, and so that fits in reasonably well into the Muscle Health Center, a research center, uh, in the sense that uh, we know that in heart disease and the arrhythmias that come with heart disease very often, there are musculoskeletal effects as well. Um, and it's not, our research is not lost on the fact that heart is a striated muscle, not unlike uh, skeletal muscle. And so we get a lot of our understanding of muscle function from our understanding of skeletal muscle. So it kind of overlaps conceptually in two ways. One is the connection between skeletal muscle uh, disease and health um, and how that connects up to cardiovascular health and disease. Uh, much of what happens in cardiovascular disease also involves uh, vascularization, uh, which is an important component of, of uh, musculoskeletal uh, disease. And then our emphasis uh, in recent years has been on the understanding of the connection between health and cardiovascular disease. And in particular, we're very uh, focused on uh, the role of uh, exercise in modulating both cardiovascular disease and also causing disease. It turns out that a very interesting observation that's become quite apparent in the last uh, 10 years or so is that endurance athletes actually have quite a high propensity towards atrial fibrillation. And actually my own lab uh, started to focus on that problem about 12 years ago or so when I was initially diagnosed with atrial fibrillation myself. Um, and so went into the lab one day and had the, had the ability to, to do the following, and that is to tell my staff, my students and my postdocs, well, we are no longer working on all these other aspects of cardiovascular disease. We're now focused completely on the role of exercise uh, and atrial fibrillation. And, and that connection is because I used to be a competitive soccer player and I have a number of friends that have developed atrial fibrillation. A lot of them are soccer players. The other group of athletes that you see this problem in is actually hockey players. Uh, virtually every, not to disclose what's going on in the hockey world, but virtually every uh, NHL team, when, once you have players over about the age of 30, there's a, a relatively high percentage of those who actually have developed or are dealing with uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So what we're doing is the, the, it's interesting because the other group of people that develop atrial fibrillation are actually the people who are the least healthy, the obese, uh, the diabetics, and the people with cardiovascular disease. So the way we look at exercise and its effects on the cardiovascular system is like it's this, it's this double-edged sword, right? We've got problems if you don't have exercise, you have problems if you have too much exercise of certain kinds of exercise. And we think we understand the connection between those, and that's what we're really uh, spending a lot of time um, doing in terms of our current research, is trying to understand the dose dependence and the type of exercise and how that impacts actually on the heart. And we think it's relevant, not just from the standpoint of atrial fibrillation, but if any of you out there are athletes, uh, you'll know that one of the most common forms of training now is HIIT training. And we're pretty confident and we're, our data suggests that hits actually have, can accelerate your, your conditioning, but they actually sort of feed into the pathways and the processes that we think are actually potentially having negative impacts on, uh, on, on uh, at least the atria of the heart and possibly the right ventricle as well. So well, first of all, we have uh, several different exercise models. So we've got forced exercise models, of which we have two treadmill running. Um, and we have two types of treadmill running as well. And then we also have uh, swim training. Uh, that's the one we use the most because we've done most of our characterization using that model and it's actually relatively straightforward. Uh, and then we also have freewheel running, so that's voluntary. And in all situations, we actually get 
the same impact. Uh, the mice, once they get a voluntary wheel, will run, depending on the strain, we use strains that actually run anywhere between 20 to 30 kilometers a night uh, once they get access to a wheel. Once we've actually introduced the training to the mice and we're doing different kinds of training, different durations, we actually put resistance on the running wheels to actually you know, mimic um, the kinds of endurance sports that, you know, where there's relatively high cardiac demand being placed. And then what we do is we assess them for vulnerability to different kinds of arrhythmias and that actually involves us do, putting a catheter into the mice doing typically what you would do if you had an arrhythmia, if you were diagnosed with things like atrial fibrillation or suspected, there's certain procedures that are done called program stimulation. So we do that to the mice. We can invoke, uh, if we introduce enough exercise, we can quite easily evoke uh, atrial fibrillation in these, in these mice. Then we also characterize physiologically the function of these hearts using echo. We also uh, explant the hearts and uh, do what's called a Langendorf preparation where we can do further assessments. Uh, we isolate cardiac myocytes and we do contraction measurements of both shortening as well as force measurements on those and calcium measurements. And our lab is largely an, an electrophysiology lab, so we break down the kinds of currents that are being affected and how these things are impacting on the arrhythmogenesis uh, using voltage clamp techniques, which is um, relatively common. And then finally, we also do, actually we do a whole bunch of other things too, but the other main um, forms that we use are tissue histology. So we do a lot of assessments of how the cells are changing in terms of their morphology and the distribution of types of tissue and cells within the heart. And then we do uh, optical mapping. So we actually take a look and see what the nature of those arrhythmias are. And interestingly enough, find that the kinds of arrhythmias that we are able to invoke in mice, although they're very, very small, I mean, the hearts are literally about, you know, I can put them in the, on the sort of end of my finger. Uh, they develop arrhythmias that have a pattern that mimics exactly what you see in the human. strategy here is we're at the level now where we think we understand what the big players are and we're trying to dissect um, which cells are actually, you know, have got this genetic um, or, or sort of genetically based biochemical pattern that actually is responsible for what we refer to as the remodeling or the changes that actually occur with, uh, with exercise. And on the flip side on disease, and it's something I didn't mention, but we're working with Dr. Sweeney and using some of his diabetes models to look on the other side of the equation. And again, to look at that interface with exercise and how that impacts.